my background or my experience is, is not related closely to portable band mills, but more toward the sawmill industry. I've worked for sawmills, I've worked for dimension mills, I've run dry kilns commercially, and I've uh, even had my own business for a while where I sold hardwood lumber on a retail mail order basis. So in that aspect is where I'm coming from. Most everything that I explained today about lumber grading and grade sawing will translate directly to working on a portable band mill. There are just a few different uh, ways in which you have to turn the log and different ways you have to handle the log on a portable band mill that aren't exactly the same as what we do on a carriage in a commercial sawmill. But other than that, I think things will translate well and together if you have questions we can, we can work them back out. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time at all. <clears throat> this morning we're going to start out talking about hardwood lumber grades. The National Hardwood Lumber Association, or NHLA, is the organization responsible for the rules that govern the sale of hardwood lumber on a wholesale basis in the United States and actually the world anymore with the markets that we have today. NHLA is composed of the member companies uh, as well as the secondary industry which are their customers and they're constantly working with the rules changing them and uh, and keeping them up to date now the grading rules are established they've been developed so that there is just no dispute at all of what grade a board is given the fact that lumber has is infinitely variable just like snowflakes the grading rules have to be very very complex in order to be able to get that end result of not having any dispute about a board. They, everything that's possible on a board between warp and cup and rot and pith and shake and wane and size, thickness, is taken into those grading rules. And they came up with a good system, although it's complicated. Now, you know, it, it's important for me as a, as a speaker today that when I get into talking about the grading rules that I set a realistic expectation for everybody here. And uh, realistically, given the complexity of the rules, the fact that it takes NHLA 14 weeks to train a person to be a beginning or apprentice grader, uh, and the fact that, I, that I, I never do a course any shorter than this, my expectation is that I'll confuse the daylights out of you today. Uh, it, it, it's a given. Don't feel bad if you feel confused. Don't feel bad if you feel, feel overwhelmed. But you need the basis of understanding of the hardwood lumber grades in order to saw hardwood logs and be able to sell them out the other end. Even if you're not selling on a wholesale basis, the same concepts of usability of the lumber, of getting the best yield out of the log, translates into the hardwood lumber grades. And it's sort of like if you don't understand the hardwood lumber grades and you don't have this basis and you're trying to saw hardwood logs, it's like having a, a recipe book in which you've got all these recipes, but there's no names as to what the product is coming out the other end. You may end up with meatloaf one day and a pound cake the next day. And it, that'll work all right if you're just feeding your own kids because you tell them you're going to finish that or else you're not leaving the table. But that's not going to work well if you're trying to sell it out to customers out the other end. So this foundation, this basis I'm going to try to give you, this, this level of confusion that you'll reach today from hardwood lumber grades, you can take that the next step. There's handout material I've given you from the little introduction to hardwood lumber grading. Uh, I'm going to steal one, which is a nice starter or basic. Some of you, when you're registered, <coughs> actually bought the NHLA training manual. The training manual uh, we just sold it at the cost that we paid NHLA for it. This is a manual they use in a 14-week course. It explains things real well. The, uh, the only other source of the grading rules is the rule book by NHLA which I defy anybody to try to understand the first time on their own so we didn't include that. But these are the concise rules this is a, an excellent explanation rule by rule with pictures which work for me and uh, this one here is a great introductory type uh, exposure for you which is where you'll start out and where we'll be working with mostly today. <clears throat> 
So let's get back into right full steam into hardwood lumber grading. Um, one of the reasons that it's confusing, like I said, is that it's a classification system that has to be able to exactly classify every board. And there's thousands of rules, and for every rule there's at least one exception. Don't ask me why, but there is. You'll, you'll get the feeling for it. But when you are confused today, I want you to step back and, and to put this on the same plane as when you first started driving. I've got a teenage daughter who's first starting to drive and uh, you know something that is very basic and simple to me when she gets behind the wheel she scares the daylights out of me. It, it's, it's really tough and she has to remember all those things that we do now subconsciously. You know when to put on the turn signal, how much to push on the gas pedal, how quickly to push on the brake or how hard to push on the brake. Um, you know if I'm lots of times I when I'm driving from one place to the next, all of a sudden I'm there and I wonder, gee, how did I get here? You know, you, you just do it subconsciously. That's how the rules will get for you. Sooner or later the rules will be subconscious where you actually know what grade that board is. Just the same way as when you drive, you end up doing all the things that, that seem so simple to you, but if you think back to when you first started driving, it's a very confusing time. Same thing with the lumber grades. So it, the nice thing about it is if you make a mistake with the lumber grades, you're just wrong about a board. When my daughter makes the mistake driving, it's a little bit scarier. But we're, we're getting that caught up. So let's work uh, with the first part of the grades. I made some transparencies. Before we start grading, we've got to understand how to measure the lumber. When lumber is inspected, commercially by a lumber inspector. They're measuring each board to determine the surface measure of the board. Surface measure is no, nothing more than the square footage on the surface of the board. They don't worry about the thickness at that point in time because they're not going to do the calculations to get board feet until they're done with inspecting that load of lumber or that day's production. So all they're concerned with is a surface measure. One foot of surface measure is 12 inches by 12 inch or one foot. Or it could be six inch wide board, two foot long. Again, it's just one square foot on that board. You take, to the, if you want to calculate it out to get the surface measure, you take the width in inches and fraction of inches times the length in whole feet, always rounding down divide it by 12 and you've got the surface measure. The other option is to use a grading stick which I did have some here. Which, there we go. Which, are, which have scales on them. One scale or line of numbers running down the stick for each length of board. For instance, on this stick, on this side it's all the odd lengths of lumber, 9, 11, 13, and 15. The back side has 12, 10, 14, and 16 on it. I'm going to pass some of these down so you can just pass them through. If you don't have a stick and you're thinking of buying one, make sure you get a four-line stick. The, there are sticks that have only three scales on each side and only deal with even lengths of board, softwood lumber. You want a hardwood lumber stick which you can use for either hardwood or softwood. I've got an overhead here that shows how the stick is used. Using the lumber roll You put the head of the stick on the edge of the board and you read directly from the scale for the board that we're talking about, for the length of the board that you're working with. The 12 foot long lumber, that would be 6 board feet. If it was 10 foot long board, it would be 5 board feet. 14 foot long would be 7. 16 would be 8. The interesting thing about the lumber rule <coughs> 
is that if we're working with 12 foot long lumber, and you remember from that equation that I gave you where we're dividing the end result of, the, of that equation by 12, it means for a 12 foot long board they cancel out and the width in inches of the board is exactly the surface measure of the board. Therefore, the 12 scale on your lumber rule is, is an inch scale. You can also use it to measure the width of a board. So it's a, it's a very simple, easy way to, to, uh, to work and get surface measure in a fast production method. Uh, yesterday I, I did a mill study at a local mill that produces about 4,000 board feet an hour and part of the mill study is I had to scale the volume of each board coming through and I was able to keep up with board after board after board no problem at all with a stick. Once you get used to where the scales are you just flip that sk stick to the right side slap it on and you've got the scale directly. You have to write that down each one for you? Yes. Yeah. I had somebody tallying for me. I didn't have time to do that too but, but it, it was very very simple operation. Just to recap a couple of the points that are quite often confused is that the length of the lumber is only considered in full foot increments. You always round down. In this example up here we've got a 12 foot 7 board, 12 foot 7 inches long. The board by NHLA calculations and methods <clears throat> is 12 foot long. There's 7 inches of over length in that board. So when you're calculating the board footage you only consider 12 foot of that board. Now you can consider some over length on each end and when we get into grading you'll understand why sometimes that's a benefit for you. Okay, here's a couple examples just to run through it fast. We've got a 12 foot 7 board which means it's 12 foot long. It's 8 and a quarter wide. The surface measure of that is going to be 8 feet. Remember I told you for a 12 foot long board the width in inches ex translates exactly to surface measure. So we've got 8 and a quarter. You always round that surface measure to the nearest foot. If it's exactly 8 and a half half of those you round up, half you round down. Don't worry about rounding errors because if you're scaling enough lumber everything's going to average out. The next board is only 8 foot 2 inches long. It's 5 and 3 quarters wide. That's going to have 4 foot of surface measure. Reason I know that is that if I've got a 6 inch board or nearly a 6 inch board the surface measure is equal to half the length. Okay? Just again we're playing with square footage Remember that first example I gave you of a six inch wide board, two foot long is one foot surface measure. Again, a lot of these come to you very fast. When you scale a lot of lumber, there's a lot of boards that come by you that you don't even have to put the stick on. You know just what the surface measure is just because it's either 12 foot long or six inches wide. Well, not that we ever make lumber that looks like this other than every day. Tapering lumber, how do we measure that? By NHLA rules and by industry standards, we measure a board that has taper such as the one in this example by measuring one third up from the narrow end. So you put the stick on that board a third of the way up. These type of boards are, are commonly come out of mills if you're sawing and you're using taper set to follow your saw kerf with the outer bark of the tree when you work off the adjoining face you end up with a tapered board unless you go and straighten off that face. So tapered lumber is measured again a third of the way up from the small end. This is a 12 foot long board. It's 11 inches at this end, 8 inches at this end. A third of the way or 4 feet up it measures 9 inches. The surface measure therefore is 9 inches. I mean 9 feet. The width of that board for determining lumber grade is 8 inches. Remember there's an exception for every rule. We measure it for footage here, we measure it for grade here. It's just, uh, just one of the normal ways that they've decided to do it by the rules. 
Okay, what about thickness? <clears throat> well, like I told you, when you get done, <coughs> excuse me, when you get done tailing a load, you then determine the board footage by multiplying that surface measure by the thickness. Now we use in the industry for standard lumber everything expressed in quarters that's an inch or thicker. Uh, don't ask me why we never reduced any of those fractions. So one inch lumber is termed four quarter, inch and a quarter is five quarter, inch and a half is six quarter, inch and three quarters seven quarter and so on. That system is one that's always been used for the rough or nominal thickness of the board. If you're going to be talking to a sawmill or you're going to be talking to a wholesaler trying to sell your lumber, he'll feel that you know a little bit more about what you're doing if you're talking in those thicknesses. In the same category of things that we wish we never cut is miscut lumber. Uh, when you're sawing, sometimes the internal stresses of a log make the log actually bow after you make the cut. Sometimes when you're working with softwood species that have very dense knots like spruce compared to the density of the wood, your blade is going to do some wandering. You're going to have lumber that's different thicknesses. When we're talking about hardwood lumber grading and those variations in thicknesses, you're allowed by the lum lumber rules a quarter of an inch in thickness variation in all boards that are from four quarter to seven quarter. In other words, from one inch thick lumber to inch and three quarters lumber, you can have a quarter inch of variation before they call that miscut lumber and unsaleable by their rules. Now, it seems a little picky, but when you, if you ever work in or see a dimension mill or high production surfacing of lumber, if you get a lot of variation in the lumber, it's not nice on equipment. If you start putting uh, thick and thin lumber through uh, a gang rip saw, for instance, where you're going to rip it before you surface it, the feed system and hold down system sometimes can't compensate for a lot of variation because it's made to put material through very fast. It's a very dangerous situation and sometimes with a lot of variation in the lumber. Hence the rules have set up the or established these maximum variations. If you've got two inch thick lumber or eight quarter lumber, you're allowed three eighths of an inch variation. And those are the ones that you'd be concerned with the most. There's smaller variation for thinner material and greater variation for larger, but it's in the, the information that I gave you in your handouts. Let's look at a board and, and use that, use this as an example. This board happened to be a four quarter or one inch thick board that got classified as miscut because it varies all the way from one inch thick to one and three eighths of an inch thick. <coughs> Remember on that previous overhead, I told you that for four quarter lumber, the maximum variation they're gonna allow you is a quarter of an inch. This end makes that a miscut board. It might be something that you trim off the end in order to make it not miscut. So you could sell it on the wholesale market or if you have a roughing planer, you put it through and, and send out a good product that's all the same thickness. Well, now we've got a fairly good idea about measuring the lumber. Let's start talking about the standard grades by NHLA. Standard hardwood lumber grades are if we're talking about clear face cuttings, which I'll explain later, the standard grades are FAS, which stands for firsts and seconds. There used to be two grades, one called first, one called seconds. The rules have combined them in recent years to FAS. Then there's FAS one face, select, number one common, number two common or 2A common, both being the same thing, number three common, or number three A common, again, both being the same thing. The A stands for clear face cutting. It means that those portions of the board that we're looking at to determine the grade, to determine the percentage of the board that's good enough to use are clear face cuttings. I'll get into clear face cuttings in a little bit. 
sound cuttings or cuttings that just are structurally sound and can have small defects, that would be 2B, 3B common, and sound wormy. <clears throat> Those are the grades that the rules are, are all revolve around. There are some exceptions, like to every rule that I told you in an NHLA rule book, but for the most part, these are the grades that you're going to be buying and selling lumber on if you get into the wholesale market to any extent at all. For those of you who have, can take out of your packet, pull out this introduction to hardwood lumber grading book. <coughs> Open it up to the dead center where it's stapled and you've got the same chart there. Let's work with this for a little while. Again, I told you that the rules are fairly complex. This is a, a simplification of the rules. In order to, to be able to classify each board into a certain grade, there's a number of factors that we have to look at. Starting with the first row across, each grade has a minimum board size. If the board isn't at least that minimum, it cannot fall into that grade. Each of these classifications going down through here are put in order of the way you look at lumber in order to grade it. In other words, a board that you're trying to establish a grade of, you look at the size of it and it all of a sudden tells you it can be either this grade or worse, but not any higher. For instance, FAS lumber has to be at least six inches wide and at least eight foot long. If it's only five and a half inches wide, Forget about it being FAS lumber, even if it's perfectly clear with no knots, no defects, no problems whatsoever on both sides. Now, there's a minimum size cutting. The rules revolve around a certain percentage of that board being usable by your end customer. Now, to come up with that percentage, we use what's called a cutting. If this is a board, and I have to apologize, foresters are not artists, but if this is a board and it's got a couple defects in it, and we want to establish the grade of that board to see what percentage of it's clear, we have to find that clear percentage in rectangular pieces called cuttings. Cuttings are are no more than visually ripping or cross-cutting sections of the board in between the knots, in between the defects, in order to find out what percentage of the board is clear. Now there's a really neat thing that about these cuttings is that each grade only allows certain minimum size cuttings. If it wasn't for that, you could take a board that had quite a number of defects and if you were allowed to have any number of cuttings and any size cutting that you wanted, you could keep sketching little rectangles on this board all day long until you almost got 99% of it clear. The, unfortunately, NHLA grade, grading doesn't allow that. So that not only do they establish the minimum size cutting, but they also establish the number of cuttings you can use to find that percent clear. Let's go back to our chart that we worked with a second ago. Minimum size cutting for FAS is four inches by five foot or three inches by seven foot. The percent that we have to get clear in those cuttings is 83 and a third or 10 twelfths or surface measure times 10. That's the yield that you have to come up with. To determine the number of cuts or these cuttings that we can put on the board you take the surface measure and divide it by four. And after this, these are some exceptions that we're not going to play around with too much today. You can get an extra cutting if you go for a little bit higher percentage yield. But let's, let's not overly confuse things any more than we have to. <coughs> Backing up to minimum sized boards and then we'll work down the, that table. For FAS, the minimum size board, as I told you, was six inches by eight foot. For select, it's four inches by six foot. For one common, it's three inches by four foot. <laughs>
And then all the way down the lower grades, it's the same. Those are the minimum sizes that that board has to be in order to make the grade. With but one exception. You'll get used to exceptions. There is a minimum width rule. It says that 90% of all lumber in a load, in a batch, must be that minimum that I just told you, except that 10% can be scant one quarter of an inch. In other words, if you ship a load of lumber or sell a pack of lumber and it's FAS, all the boards have to be six inches wide except for 10% of them which can be a quarter of an inch scant of that width and still make the grade. Same thing for the other sizes. For those of you who have only been doing softwoods, I guess I better stop, step back a bit and, and hit one of the obvious things. Is hardwood lumber is sold, sold, is sawn, is manufactured totally random width. You maximize the width you can get out of the lumber. You don't cut uh, one by sixes out of, out of red oak and, and make much money. And sometimes you will have customers walk in and want to buy lumber on a retail basis for you and they'll want all red oak 1x12s. used to love those. <laughs> if, I'd always tell them if they could supply the logs, I'd probably try to cut it. But with, it, it's just not something that we do with hardwoods, number one, because of the expense of the standing timber, but also because we, the use of hardwoods always involves gluing up to make the end product the width you need in the end product. Stability of hardwoods requires that you glue up. In other words, if we got a, a board 12 inches wide into a dimension mill, we always rip that board into four inches or narrower. Don't care if it was perfectly clear. And we were making 12 inch wide panels to go into kitchen cabinet, door fronts. You always rip it because it's going to cup, it's going to bowl. I don't care how much polyurethane you put on it, it's still going to change moisture content from one season to the next. And you need to educate your customers if you sell on a retail basis dry lumber because it may be dry today, but it's going to still change moisture content. And you've got to take that all into account. We'll work on that a little bit more later. Just to give you some examples or some pictures of, of the minimum size boards, is that again, 10% of the boards in FAS can be five and a quarter five and three quarters wide. The selects can, 10% can be three and three quarters and the common 10% can be two and three quarters. Again, scant one quarter of an inch on 10% of the boards without having any problem. The number one biggest mistake that portable bandsaw mills make, which prevents them from selling lumber into the hardwood market easily, isn't thickness variation, but it's too thin a lumber. They, they, it, it's real easy to be out there sawing and, and figure on your, whether you have a, a, a circular rule like the timber harvester has or whether you have a rule going up and down uh, that's telling you what thickness you're sawing or where you're indexing your saw for the next cut. It's real easy to add an inch or subtract an inch from your last cut, but that's not going to give you four quarter lumber because your, your variation, although it's, you're fairly accurate with a portable band mill with a sharp saw that's properly set, you still can't be sawing four quarter lumber that's exactly one inch thick because you're going to go under it and you're not going to be able to sell it because people aren't going to be able to surface it down to 13 sixteenths of an inch. They aren't going to be able to make furniture out of it. And that is what has given portable band mills the worst reputation out there in the wholesale market and why you can't break into the wholesale market easily is sawing lumber too thin. Now, if we start talking about commercial sawmills, circle sawmills, the, uh, the target set, uh, target set means the thickness they're trying to saw is generally inch and an eighth for one inch lumber. Now, some of the more modern band saw mills that we have I mean production bandsaw mills with, with 12 foot tall head rigs 
Those type of rigs are more accurate, especially in mills that are also have resaws, which are six foot tall band saws. They are sawing at a target set of inch and a sixteenth. You should be hitting a target set somewhere around inch and a sixteenth when you're sawing. Between that and inch and an eighth. If you think you're getting a lot of variation, if your blade's getting a little bit dull or you're losing the set in it and you're not going to change it, then you better start sawing an inch and an eighth to make up for that variation that you're going to be putting in. If you get more variation in an eighth of an inch plus or minus, get that blade off there and get a new one. I'm trying to tell you something. Okay, or you're pushing the saw too fast. Yes, question in back. That would be inch and an eighth target minus the curve or is that the curve? Inch and an eighth target for the board after you pull it off the saw. So it would be not including the curve. For, for the curve is so thin on a portable band mill that you don't have to be too concerned with it. Uh, you know, personally, if I was uh, going to be sawing a, a lot of four quarter lumber, if I had to saw a lot of four quarter hardwood lumber on a mill, I'd set up my whole, a whole separate scale that had increments or slash marks on it that were exactly inch and a sixteenth or a little bit over it to take care of the kerf and that's that's where I would be indexing each additional cut would be to those marks rather than full inch marks. Full inch marks don't help you a lot, you got to do an awful lot of math or a lot of figuring and and lots of times that's where you make your mistakes. You know, especially any of you guys who are doing this to any great extent and you're putting in a full day, an eight hour or longer day, at the end of the day it's real easy to make mistakes. And that's again where we're getting the thickness variation. Yes? The guy we're selling to has asked us to saw to nine eighths. Okay, the guy you're selling to wants you to saw it to nine eighths. So he's, he's actually asking to saw an eighth over for target set. Um, that's, that's acceptable. I'd scrimp on it just a little bit until he started yelling at me. And, uh, because, because if you keep a, a sharp blade, and if you keep a good set in your teeth, you are as more accurate than a circle saw rig, which is sawing an inch and an eighth. And uh, you, you can scrimp a bit. You, you gotta sell your lumber, yes, but uh, you don't have to give it away. You know, one of the neat things about a portable band mill is that accuracy and that thin kerf and use those things to your advantage so that you're getting that overrun, overrun being extra lumber over that scale of the log scale that you, you had going in. It's kind of like uh, you know, making something out of nothing if you have a thousand foot of logs and you end up having 1400 foot of lumber out the other end. And, and don't lose that by sawing too thick. But Again, I, I know I'm saying it too many times, I know I'm repeating it too many times, but sawing the right thickness, it, it, it cannot be stressed too much. You really got to saw your four quarter lumber thicker than you're sawing your, your one inch thick softwoods. Otherwise it won't make it into the market. Are they as fussy <coughs> on one and two common as they are on F FAS? They're just as fussy on every, every grade. Uh, three common that I don't get too worried about. Mainly because three common lumber very seldom gets surfaced, it's going into pallets and that variation isn't a problem with the type of machinery that's set up to, to, to run pallets. But keep in mind that if I, uh, when I worked for the Dimension Mill, we uh, had a customer home crest that made kitchen cabinets. That, that customer when we were working with them, had a lot of uh, kitchen cabinet fronts that were, you know, you know the, the front door of it, your kitchen cabinet, the raised panel of it sometimes only 18 inches long. That we got out of two common lumber. Okay, so the lumber, just because it's two common lumber doesn't mean that it's not going into upper end furniture, upper end cabinets, uh, because it is. You know, they, they, a mill, a dimension mill can't stay in business sawing just are running through their operation just select and better or FAS lumber. So that's it's a good question, but the thickness variation makes a difference. Everything above uh, three common. David? Yes. Is a quarter of an inch the maximum scant allowed? 
exactly. In this example here. It, a quarter inch is a maximum scan allowed on the minimum board size. And when I had that, uh, that the overhead up before, remember that you measure the board for that minimum board size at the thinnest, the narrowest portion. Okay, that tapered board I had up there, we scale it a third of the way up from the narrow end, but to find out how much surface measures in it, but we determine a minimum board by the narrowest part for making grade. Okay, now the, the next one that I briefly touched on and I want to go in a little bit more in depth are cuttings. If you want to read it straight from the rule book, a cutting is, is a portion of board or plank obtained by cross cutting or ripping or both. In the common grades, the cutting shall be flat enough to surface two sides to the standard surface thickness, which for four quarter lumber is 13 sixteenths of an inch. After that cutting has been removed from the board, okay? In the grades FAS and selects, the entire board shall be flat enough to surface to that thickness. Now this is something you're not going to be concerned with too much unless you're kiln drying, okay? Uh, and when I say, you know, let's back up to that board when you're sawing it that has a little bit of tension in it and it comes out and it's got a hump to it. That doesn't mean surfacing it to that thickness that you're going to run it over a joiner to make it a perfectly straight board. That means you're going to run it through the planer just the way it is and it's still going to have this shape but it's all going to be 13 sixteenths or for four quarter inch lumber and that's a standard thickness or standard surface thickness according to the NHLA. So just to back up, in FAS and select, the entire board has to be surfaced to that thickness and one common, each of those cuttings after they're removed to, from the board have to be surfaced to that. But the variation that causes those problems generally comes out in kiln drying that makes this rule more important to remember when you're working with scaling and grading kiln dried lumber, which most of you aren't going to be doing right off the bat. Cuttings must be by rips or cross cuts, cannot be by diagonal cuts. Your rips have to be parallel to one side. Uh, Why? Why? Because in a production setting, in a dimension mill, which are, are considered the customers of this wholesale lumber, they can't do that. Uh, they, they, not, not easily. They do have straight line rip saws, but they always think linear along parallel to the edges. This is just an example of a lower grade board that allowed quite a few different cuttings of small sides. We got number one, two, four, and five by ripping and three by cross cutting. You know when we did the rips, the rip line didn't have to go all the way to the end of the board. It could vary different width for this piece as for that piece. So they can be different shapes within the board. You're only visually doing this ripping and cross cutting obviously. Okay, off of that same table that I had you open up and look in the inside of the introductory book to hardwood lumber grading, are the minimum size cuttings. Remembering I told you that if they didn't give us a minimum size we could get 99 percent clear out of most boards because you just keep sketching these rectangles. For FAS and select lumber the minimum size is four inches by five foot or three inches by seven foot. That means that if we've got only five foot long cutting available, it has to be at least four inches wide. It could be four and a quarter, four and an eighth, four and three quarters, five inches wide, anything above that. If you can get a seven foot long cutting lengthwise visually out of the board, then it can be a minimum of three inches. One common is four by two or three by three. Both two A and B as well as three A is three inches by two foot and 3B common, which is, uh, is a type of stuff that's hard to sell to anybody, you can have cuttings as, that are not less than inch and a half wide containing not less than 36 square inches. Real small cuttings. Okay, here's a neat example. What if we use our 
one quarter inch scant allowable rule for that 10% of the board and we have to get a three inch cutting out of that board. If you can find a way to do it, you're gonna make good money real quick. It's not gonna be able to be found a three inch cutting in a two and three quarter inch wide board. So the rules have made an exception for that rule like most of the others, that when you go a quarter inch scant, provided that the cutting is full width of the board, to make that grade, the cutting can also be a quarter inch scant. It can't be that you have a three inch wide board and you take a two and three quarter cutting. Wrong. The cutting has to be full width of the board if you use this exception of the cutting being a quarter inch scant on boards that are quarter inch scant. Okay, we've talked enough about cuttings now. I explained quickly, but I want to go into a little more in depth clear face cuttings. Clear face cutting are the cuttings that you're going to be using 95% of the time. You're not going to sell a whole lot of lumber by sound cuttings. All of your standard grades that I explained before, FAS select, one common, two common and three common, or 2A and uh, 1A or 2A or 3A, all are based on a, that portion of the board that needs to be found in those cuttings to make the grade being in clear face cuttings. A clear face cutting is basically a cutting that has no defects on the side you're grading and the back side has to be free of rot, pith, shake, let's back, back up, pith, P-I-T-H, is the dead center of the tree. It's, it's that portion of the tree that first grew from the first sprout that is a little bit unstable so they don't want it in lumber so it's got to be free again to back up from rot, pith, shake, wane, unsound knots, or lack of wood which is wane without the bark. They cannot be on the back side of a clear face cutting. The, uh, let's see if I've got some examples of clear face cutting. Okay, we've got the number one cutting in this top board here that it says no. Even though it's totally clear on this side, the back side of it has some wane. These two black marks on there which make it unsound. That is not an acceptable clear face cutting. Here's the second one. It is acceptable because it has a sound knot. All right, now we're in, in sound knot, that's a, that's a little bit of a tougher gray area. It's not like uh, white pine or red pine where it's either a red knot or a, a black knot or you have some color that's going to tell you whether the knot's sound or not. Generally, if the knot's getting over an, an inch in diameter, even if it looks perfectly sound, the chances are it's going to have some voids open up in it when you, when you kiln dry it and it is unsound. Most of those knots anyway are going to surface through to the other side as soon as they try to surface. That's why they don't want bigger knots on there. Really what they're looking for in calling a sound knot is something about a third of the size that, they, that we used in this, this picture. It's sketched a little bigger so you can see it. Just those real small little knots that aren't going to surface through and really aren't going to hurt the back side of a piece of furniture where you can't see it. The third one is, is actually clear on both sides. It worked around this, this odd shape knot here and this little bit of rot here and it, it came out to be a real nice cutting that's totally clear. So two and three are acceptable, one's not acceptable in that board. Sound cuttings are those cuttings that we use maybe 5% or less of the time when you're selling lumber under the 2B or 3B standard lumber grade. 2B common or 3B common. B meaning sound cuttings. A sound cutting is free from rot, pith, shake, and wane, but it doesn't consider texture. You can have sound knots, bird pecks, stain, streaks, and season checks that don't affect the strength of the board. It's this type of lumber uh, that we throw a lot of the wormy red maple into. Uh, a lot of the soft maple or red maple, and at least in New York State and, 
and other places in its range it grows in swampy areas has those real small worm holes in them. They're about the size of the diameter of the lead of your pencil if you were to poke at it. They're, they're considered un, unsound or they're considered to be in it. I mean they're considered to be sound and allowable in a sound cutting. This type of lumber is used for the interior structure of furniture, upholstered furniture or secondary wood and other types of furniture. Boards that you're not going to see. Maybe rails for a drawer, uh, maybe a, a glue block here or there in a piece of furniture and all the structural pieces in your couch that you've got, upholstered couch you have at your house. So they're, they're allowing streaks, quarter inch holes, up to half inch holes in the sound portion of an, an unsound knot even in that cutting for those grades. Here's another picture or example we can work with. Got some sound knots, some streaks, got some worm holes. The, uh, on the back side of that, these, both these knots here, this one that was a little dot here and this bigger one are both unsound defects. So we were able to take a cutting here through all these small worm holes and we were able to take some through these sound knots here and the streaks weren't affecting the back side. Pretty ugly lumber when it comes out the other end, uh, but they don't pay a whole lot for it either, so you don't have to worry. Okay, tap hole would be, uh, if it's under half an inch, then it would be considered a includable in a sound cutting. It would definitely not be included in any portion of a clear face cutting. Even if it diagonally went across the back of the board, it wouldn't be allowable in that clear face cutting. Cutting units. Now, I told you that we use these cutting units, these pieces that we visually get by cross cutting or ripping out of a board to determine what percentage of the board makes the clear face cuttings makes that percent to be able to get your grade. Well, we've got to have a way of measuring those. Well, we have to use a little bit finer system of measurement than the surface measure. Surface measure was just in full square foot of measurement rounded to the nearest foot. We can't use that for these small cuttings that may be, you know, five inches wide by seven foot long or, or, or in that range. So we Take the cutting unit down a step. Instead of being 12 inches by 12 inches in the surface measure, instead it is 1 inch by 12 inches. It's exactly 12 square inches. A foot of surface measure is equal to 12 cutting units. That's how we start measuring these cuttings to see if it makes the grade. Now before I get you too worried about all this stuff, <coughs> when lumber is coming by a lumber inspector, he has tuned his eye, he has tuned his ability to judge lumber to where he doesn't measure these cutting units hardly ever at all. The real good inspectors will do one board a day that looks like it's on the edge between two grades. But most lumber grades itself without having to go into this detail. But I want you to understand this detail just in case you ever have somebody argue with you whether a board's one grade or not so you can go through this. To calculate the number of units in a cutting, you multiply by the width of the cutting in inches and fractions of an inch times the length in feet and fractions of a feet, of a foot, of a feet, <laughs> length in feet and fractions of a foot is equal to the number of cutting units. So you're not dividing it by 12 like we did in a surface measure and you're not rounding the feet down to the nearest, to the low next foot down that we did in surface measure. So inches and fraction of inches times feet and fraction of feet is equal to cutting units. For those of you who have kids in junior high and they've made you have to remember how to do fractions again, this is going to be simple. For those of you who haven't played with fractions in a while, you may scratch your head. But don't worry, like I said, you're not going to be doing this on every board that goes by you. And in fact, 
once you get yourself to where you're subconsciously grading very fast, you'll just do it once a day with a board that's on the edge just to tune your eye to where you get a little bit better at what you're doing. Here's a board six inches wide by eight foot long that we're going to try to see how many units are in it. You take the six inch wide cutting here by four foot two inches, which is six by four and a sixth. We multiply four times six to get 24. Then we take one sixth times six to get one, 25 units. The five inch cutting that's off the other end of this board is three foot six inches long or three and a half foot long. Five times three and a half, you do the five times a three or fifteen. Half times a five is five halves or two and a half or seventeen and a half units. Now if we take those units and add them up, they have to make that minimum percentage clear. For FAS, remember I told you that the board had to be 83 and one-third percent clear. 83 and a third, or easier terms to work with, 10 twelfths. And easier to work with than that if you take the surface measure times the 10 of the 10 twelfths, that's how many cutting units have to be in that board in order to make FAS. A way to put it graphically, even though you're not going to have one end of the board clear and the other end not, it's easy to see the percent that you have to make. For FAS, you need 10 twelfths. It means for a 12 foot long board, you have to have 10 foot of clear material in it. Now, it, you, obviously, it'd be simple to grade if all of them were where the defects were in one end of the board, but this at least visually gives you a picture of how much clearness there should be in it. One common for most lumber, you're going to be working with 8 twelfths clear. You have to have 8 foot clear in every 12 foot or that percentage clear in other boards. Smaller boards in one common have some exceptions that let's not worry about. Again, and once you understand the rule and you understand all the rules, you can start playing with the exceptions. If for every rule you don't know one exception, then you don't know one part of the rule because like I said, they've got them every, in every one. Uh, in two common, you're looking for half of the board clear in most boards. Any board that's two foot surface measure or greater, which is most of the lumber you're going to be sawing, other than those little boards like this, it is going to be 50% clear. I'm only going to touch on this real briefly because I don't want to get you too much in depth to where you wish you never graded another piece of hardwood again or never saw it. But there are the exceptions to where if you, on an FAS board, instead of going 10 twelfths, if you, if you think that one extra cutting in that board will give you a lot more toward that clearness, you can go for 11 twelfths clear instead of 10 twelfths clear on boards that measure from 6 to 15 foot surface measure in order to get FAS. You get one more rectangle on the board. With selects, you still the 11 twelfths and it's on the FAS face only. One common is 9 twelfths for the extra cutting and 2, 2A and 2B is 8 twelfths and doesn't apply to 3 common because you already get so many cuttings you don't know what to do with most of the time anyway. Remember the analogy I gave you between driving a car and grading lumber. The neat thing about grading lumber is that you can work on one rule at a time and try to refine yourself on that rule. And there's no better way to learn lumber grading than out there with a portable band mill. Uh, maybe NHLA school if you want to spend 14 weeks away from home. Uh, but I, you know, you can be just as good a grader if you take these rules and learn them one at a time. So work maybe for a while just with the minimum width rule to where you can gauge what size the lumber is and whether it would make grade based on that side. And then add one rule at a time. It isn't like the driving where you got to know all the rules right off from the start. And, and, and you just can't go out on the road unless you got a pretty good grasp of all those rules or, or it's a real scary situation. Take them one at a time, work with them one at a time, and when you have it mastered, add another one on. Okay, there are some other things that we're going to deal with next, but I think I want to give you a break here right now.
and let's let's break for 10 minutes so everybody can stretch, move around a little bit. We'll come back and uh, I'll get into some of the different limitations that apply to the rules as well.